metaphors may frame or illuminate or uh, make us see their subjects in certain kinds of ways, right? So um, uh, George Lakoff has a book, Don't Think of an Elephant, which is all about the ways in which metaphors especially uh, frame our, uh, you know, patterns of thought in ways that are very powerful and, like, you know, have important influences for political discourse, for instance. Um, so metaphors frame their subjects, getting us to think about them, the subjects from a certain perspective. And this makes them really powerful communicative tools. Uh, and this is, you know, uh, as famously illustrated by Romeo soliloquizing on uh, stage, talking about his beloved uh, Juliet, and he says, Ah, oh, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the sun, it is the east, and Juliet is the sun, right? And in this relatively compressed short phrase, Romeo communicates a whole rich way of thinking about Juliet, which he then goes on to sort of elaborate for, I don't know, 20 lines or something, right? He sort of spells out the ways in which Juliet is the sun, um, and Juliet is like the sun, and why this makes her so amazing. And he, you feel that he could go on and on, uh, you know, sort of this open-ended, powerful way of thinking about her that this exemplifies and leads you into. So this is a general phenomenon in thinking about metaphor. I think it's especially palpable and especially powerful when metaphors are used as insults, when they're used to, uh, not to praise, as in uh, Julia's son, but to denigrate. And so I've given you a range of metaphorical insults, uh, which are, you know, sort of things that, uh, these examples are sort of, uh, well, uh, here on the, on the handout. So next one is again from, uh, from Shakespeare. This is uh, King Lear talking about one of his daughters. So Lear has three daughters. Cordelia is wonderful. Goneril and Regan are these horrible, sort of uh, selfish, you know, uh, grabbing wenches and who have, you know, given up filial responsibility. And I can't remember which one it is, but he's attacking her, saying how horrible she is. And he says, but yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter, or rather a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, or a boss carbuncle in my corrupted blood. So as he goes on for a while, this is a pretty powerful set of images. It communicates a quite powerful, quite uh, intense set of feelings. It arouses a um, powerful set of images, uh, and sort of you feel like, he could keep going with the denigration in that ma in that line of attack uh, where he's set up with this uh, metaphor. A um, couple more examples. Uh, this one is modeled on Dick Moran, who I'll be talking about a bunch today. Um, George is a tail wagging lapdog of privilege. You get the picture of like a little guy who's sort of you know you know trying to suck up to people who have more power. Um, uh, another one, this is maybe more outdated, but uh, in this uh, uh, Ted Cohen, again, who I'll be talking about, is imagining a faculty meeting, you know, where, where people, uh, professors are arguing about important things like, um, you know, who would invite for the speaker series next year or something, and the, um, and the one faculty member says, German, you are a Bolshevik. And so that's supposed to sort of, again, conjure up an image and, uh, you know, have a powerful effect that is, would be difficult to state in literal terms. Uh, and then last one is uh, Churchill talking about Mussolini. He says, the boastful Mussolini has crumpled already. He is now but a lackey and a serf, the merest utensil of his master's will. And there's a thought that the way, I and mean, the feeling you should have is that the way in which um, Mussolini is here depicted as in relation to Hitler is this a barrier. I mean, he's just a utensil, a mere utensil. And that is uh, something, the power that would be difficult to capture in, in literal terms. Um, okay, so metaphors, powerful, especially when used as insults. There's something more specific that metaphors as insults seem to do, uh, which uh, uh, makes them especially powerful. So when used as in uh, insults, they engender a kind of complicity in their hearers, which makes direct refusal uh, difficult. So complicity is a feeling of responsibility or having contributed to this kind of insult, contributed to having made something happen uh, in a way that you feel guilty or responsible for. Um, so I'm going to give you three quotes uh, just where people are uh, sort of from philosophers who are uh, trying to point to, allude to, make, you know, get you to feel the sense of complicity, and then I'm going to try to say more about it and make sense of it. Um, so first one is uh, Wayne Booth. Uh, first two are from, uh, well, okay. first one's from Wayne Booth. He says, the speaker has, when making a metaphorical insult, the speaker has performed a task by yoking what the hearer had not yoked together, bringing together in thought two things that hadn't been brought together before. 
and the hearers simply cannot resist joining him. They thus perform an identical dance step, and the metaphor accomplishes at least part of its work. It does something important, even if the hearer then draws back and says, oh, I shouldn't have allowed that. Um, um, uh, okay, so that's the first, that's this idea of irresistibility. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, there's a handout if you can, uh, you know. Uh, okay, so then here's Dick Moran picking up on and uh, elaborating on this notion. He says, part of the dangerous power of a strong metaphor is its control over one's thinking at a level beneath that of deliberation or volition. In the mind of the hearer, an image is produced that's not chosen or willed. Again, this sort of, I, you know, I can't resist. Um, the not my, up to my, not, I'm not, not something I want what I willed to do. The full appreciative comprehension of a metaphor makes any subsequent denial of the point it makes seem feeble or disingenuous in much the same way that appreciative understanding of a joke can overpower any subsequent refusal of the point it makes. Uh, since the dam, and then Moran concludes, sort of giving a, that was supposed to be a description of what you recognize what's going on in this kind of situation, and then uh, he interprets that, he says, since the damaging effect is not carried by the assertion, by the claim that's being made, it's not well countered by denial of the assertion. Now the third comment, uh, the third elaboration is from Ted Cohen, uh, same volume as the original quote from Wayne Booth. He says, uh, so he originally says, you know, his, his overall point, which is something I'll return to, is the idea that metaphors cultivate a, cultivate a certain kind of intimacy between hearer and speaker. And he says, intimacy sounds like a nice thing, it sounds like a good thing, but it need not always be. Sometimes a speaker draws, so, well, sometimes you may draw someone near in order to thrust the knife you know, get close enough to thrust the knife in, right? And so he says, and uh, elaborating that, he says, when the device is a hostile metaphor or a cruel joke requiring much background and effort to understand, it's all the more painful because the victim has been made a complicitor in his own denies, demise. And so that's where this, that's where he makes explicit this notion of complicity uh, that's running uh, throughout. Okay, so there are three things that I think are going on that these guys are all sort of, they're, they're related phenomena that I think all three of these guys are pointing to here in, with respect to metaphorical, metaphorical insults. They all think metaphorical insults are especially distinctively powerful rhetorical devices, and they're pointing to three related way features that make that the case. One is the sense of irresistibility, of going along even though you don't want to. The second is that that going along uh, makes denial, makes the hearer, it makes any subsequent denial on the hearer's part difficult or undermines it. You can't say, say no, or I don't agree, or that's false, seems sort of beside the point, or it doesn't touch something in the heart of the matter in some way. So that's difficulty in denial. And then the third point is, which is related, well, the third point is the sense of complicity, this feeling of having done something that you shouldn't have done. Uh, so I'm gonna, so my, interest today, my task today, is to try to explain uh, something about why those things happen. Why do metaphorical insults do that? This is an interesting phenomenon. Why do they do that? Um, what all three of these uh, philosophers do, to a greater or lesser extent, is they want to say, these things are so amazing, these, uh, you know, these metaphorical insults are so amazing, um, uh, that they, we need something really special to explain what they're doing. And so in particular, Moran says, so, uh, so uh, he said, uh, you know, Moran says, it might seem to follow from the things I said before, that uh, metaphors function largely outside the language game of assertion, agreement, and denial, right? They're doing something else. They're in a different line of business than giving you a piece of information which you can say yes or no to. Uh, so that's, that's a line of thinking that people have pursued in order to explain, to respect and do justice to the power and the richness and the distinctive amazingness of metaphor, and especially metaphor insults, we have to t say they're doing something special and different from communication, from ordinary communication. Um, I don't think that's right. So I'm here today to defend metaphor, to say yes, metaphor does do something special and interesting and important, but not because it's doing something different in kind, because it's in a different line of business from ordinary speech, but rather because it's combining elements that we see across ordinary speech in lots of different kinds of places of ordinary speech, combines them in a distinctively powerful package. So in particular, I'm gonna argue that metaphors use, um, uh, they use three things, perspectives, presupposition, and pragmatic communication. Uh, they combine those three features in a unique package that makes them especially powerful. Uh, so in a way, the take home lesson is something, yes, metaphors are amazing, and indeed, 
They're um, distinctively rhetorically powerful, but not because they're doing something different in kind, but rather because they're doing something the other speech does, and that should help us to see how interesting and fraught and complicated and powerful ordinary speech can be. So rather than sort of downplaying the, um, rather than say, assimilate, say metaphors are like ordinary speech by, and downplaying the power, power of metaphor, I want to say this kind of cool interesting stuff is going on more of the time than we often like to think. And you've got to be careful of that. Okay? You know, you know, be interesting. You've got to be careful, you've got to be on your guard, you've got to pay attention to this stuff. Okay, so that's the sort of game plan. That's where we're going. So. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain in the next section, section two, I'm going to be explaining these features, these three features that I think of pra uh, pra pra uh, perspectives, presupposition, and pragmatics. I'm going to explain what they are and how I think they're working and how they combine. Um, and then I want to respond to an objection that I think is a pretty important, interesting, revealing objection. Okay? All right. So first thing to do, I said, oh, metaphors, whatever the starting point for thinking about metaphor, you know, is that metaphors frame their subjects, they make you think of, see the subjects in a certain way, under a certain way. What does this talk about seeing as? What does seeing as mean? Talk about seeing as must itself be metaphorical. Because when you're see, when, when you're thinking, when, when your metaphors often have this effect of seeing as, even when you're not seeing something as something. Right? So in particular, uh, you can't see life as but a walking shadow. There's nothing to see, there's nothing to picture when you imagine life as but a walking shadow. Right? And even to go back to our original metaphor, if you, I mean, you could maybe see or imagine or visualize Juliet as the sun, but if you did that, I think that'd be the wrong kind of activity. You'd be sort of imagining her being big and glowing and sort of you know, floating, and that's not what you should be doing. You should be engaging in some other kind of enterprise. So the idea of seeing as here is itself a metaphorical notion. In understanding metaphor, what is that notion? So what I think, there's a lot to say about here about this. Um, I'm just going to be very brief. Uh, I think one thought organizes our overall thinking about another uh, about another subject, uh, much as we much in, a, in a way that's strongly analogous to what happens in perception, but it's not necessarily in perception. Okay. And so that's why I put this figure here on the um, on the handout. So this is the the one you know. There's a lot of stuff on the handout that I want you to you know study, in, but this is the one point where you really got to have everything on the handout. So um, so this it can be seen. This figure can be seen both as a figure of an old lady and as a figure of a young lady. All right. So how many people can see it both ways? Good for you. Um, how many people can only see it as the picture of the young lady? Great for me, even better. Okay, and how many people can only see it as a figure of the old lady, the other way around? What? Okay, all right, all right. So, there are some fe features of what's going on. I'm just going to lead you through this case, and then I'll say something about uh, how it how it, uh, how it does. So I'm going to not leave you hanging in you know the state of suspension here. So. So one thing I just want you to notice is that seeing as, as you guys are exemplifying, is partly but not entirely under your willful control. It's something you can try to see, but trying, and I do you believe me and your colleagues and people, other people in this room, that it can be seen the way you can't see it, but it's not enough to see the thing and believe that it can be seen that way to actually see it that way. You've got to actually click it in, right? You've got to actually bring it to bear. And now, as I hope to demonstrate, uh, you it, finding out more stuff, directing your attention in certain kinds of ways, using trying to use certain kinds of concepts, can help to get you to lock in the right, the relevant kind of concept. Ultimately, it's sort of something that happens to you, the gestalt quick click, but it's something that I can help you with. And when it does happen, all of a sudden everything hangs together in a new kind of way, and it hangs together so that individual parts have a certain kind of significance and play a certain role in relation to the rest of the whole. Okay? So, it looked like more people could see it as the young lady and not the old lady. So I'm going to start with that one. So if you can see it as a young lady, to try to get it to be an old lady, take the young lady's um, little nose, her little button nose, that's a warp on the old lady's nose. The young lady's necklace is the old lady's mouth. The young lady's chin is the bottom of the old lady's nose, 
nobody's giving me a satisfying aha. Uh -huh. I'm, you know, all right, you're good. Okay, you okay, you got it. Done. Okay, so who's still stuck? Who's oh, that's that was the aha uh -huh I was looking for. Good. So are there who, are there still people who can't see it as the old lady? Great, or at least you're too embarrassed now, right? But uh, so uh, if it's not an embarrassment, that means that there are at least you know uh, six of you or so who were stuck in not being able to see, and then now I helped you by pointing to elements, giving you an interpretation of certain elements, and then at some point that allowed it to click in, okay? So now the other way around, if you can see it as the old lady, I think really it helps to say the old lady's mouth is the young lady's uh, necklace, is a necklace on the young lady. Um, the old lady's looking down, the young lady is looking back. Uh, anybody still stuck on the young lady? You can't get the young lady. All right, so now we have a room full of people who can do both. Oh, are you stuck? Okay. Uh, yeah. I thought it's a first time. Yes. The first time that this seemed to be a young lady, but when you explained it, yep. it changed my email. Then I started, oh, it is also old. Yeah. Um, so one thing that's interesting is once you've seen it both ways, you usually can't go back to not being able to see it both ways. Uh, and so usually you can you can lock it in, but it may be that uh, for certain reasons some some one aspect is easier to see than the other. Then, then we listen to some description about the yep. and then we can see in the part. Yes, right, right. So 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 the points I want to get from this are that there's something it's con you're using concepts you're using concepts in a certain kind of way, but they have to play a role in perception. And when they do, it's this sort of structural role. Things hang together, and they they give the elements in the picture a new kind of significance under that whole sort of gestalt, under that whole aspect. Okay, so that's what I think is going on in perception. I think something very like that is going on in cognition when we have seeing as the kind of seeing as thing people are thinking of as framing or perspectives in the case of metaphor. So, in speaking metaphorically in particular. You take uh, a speaker invites his hearer to employ a characterization of one thing, say the sun, to structure and organize uh, and lend significance to their way of thinking about something else, say Juliet. Right. So Romeo asks us to organize our overall thinking about Juliet in terms of our idea, our characterization, our way of thinking, our intuitive way of thinking about the sun. Um, and in particular, so what does it mean to structure your thinking in a certain kind of way? Well, I think it's, you know, this is a matter partly for psychology, partly for philosophical analysis, but I think what it means is you take features that are very important in our thinking about the uh, sun, and you look for matches to them in your, in your understanding about Juliet, and when you find a match, you sort of raise it to more significance, to more prominence. And I can talk you know, endlessly about what I think is going on in this kind of case, but uh, in, in this kind of restructuring. But basically, there's kind of restructuring where you start with features of the framing idea, and you use that to look for matches in the subject idea. So now, given that very fast characterization of what's going on in perspectives, how can that explain this phenomenon, these phenomena that these guys are talking about, about how uh, we have complicity, irresistibility, and, deny, and difficulty of denial? What, how do those follow from what I've just said? Well, I think perspectives produce these perspectives, this framing effect in the mind, produces complicity because understanding the speaker's utterance, for the hearer to figure out, to understand the speaker's utterance, requires doing something with your mind. It requires actually structuring your mind in a certain kind of way. It's not enough just to have the idea. It's got to click. It's got to do this work of structuring. And that's something that, you know, it requires sort of you getting on board and making intuitive sense to you in a certain kind of way. So uh, uh, it requires the hearer to actually structure her thinking in the speaker's intended way, even if just temporarily, even if just, you know, you're going to try to get rid of it, but even just to understand the utterance. You've got to go through this process of molding your mind in a certain kind of pattern. Why are such metaphorical perspectives, why are they irresistible? Well, they, they this is going to go back to your question. Uh, so there are a couple reasons. One, in the case of uh, metaphor in particular, Characterizing, doing this kind of strict thinking raises, uh, just because part of your thinking about the relevant subject and part of the matches often involves vivid images or vivid strong feelings. And just having, raising those to conscious awareness itself has important, like, you know, there, there are these uh, sort of feelings that there are things in you that have been raised to awareness, that have been raised to sort of power, to, to presence. Uh, and those might be things that you find disturbing, uh, uh, that you might, might find disturbing. Um, but in addition, uh, aspects, frames, gestalts can lock in involuntarily, even if you don't want them to. So, uh, and then you can be sort of stuck with them, 
right? So uh, in particular, um, uh, you know, you might think, so this happened to me, I had a colleague, um, and the colleague had certain kinds of mannerisms, and um, I'm like, sort of like, you know, whatever, and then, and I, you know, basically kind of liked this colleague, or I wanted to like this colleague, and, um, uh, you know, whatever, uh, and then one day, I saw him as a rat, right? And so, all this, it all sort of clicked in, and I didn't want it to, but it did, and then I couldn't get rid of it, right? And I was stuck with all the way, and it was not very uh, practically efficacious. It was a problem. It made me more difficult for me to deal with him in a sort of, you know, when the Gestalt had locked him, right? And that kind of thing can happen more generally. Uh, uh, you know, it, it happens in perception in particular, but it can happen in thought as well. So just the, a, a Gestalt can have this kind of locking in effect this intuitive uh, structuring effect, even if we don't like it, even if we don't want it, and, and apart from our will. Um, uh, and in particular, if a bunch of you, when you looked at this uh, figure, immediately right off the bat, you saw it one way, without having to try or without you know, choosing. And so you know, that, in that same kind of way, uh, you had to struggle to see it the other way. In the same kind of way, the same kind of thing can happen in, in cognition. And then why does this, why are perspectives difficult to deny? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons, but one thing is, that, and I'm going to go through some more of those reasons later, but one of the reasons is that they're not just propositions. They're not just pieces of information. They're doing something with your mind, right? So it's, if, if, I'm say, if I say, you know, um, he is the children, he's the child of a, stock, a, a hedge fund manager, to communicate that he's a rich, if, if, so if, if instead of saying that George is a tail wagging left dog of privilege, I said, you know, he went to an Ivy League school and he's, uh, you know, the child of stockbrokers, that would be some factual information that I could say no to, right? That would be a piece, of, a piece of propositional information. This molding of your mind, structuring of your mind, is not just a piece of information of that kind. It's a lot of different ways of thinking structured together in a certain kind of way. And that makes it especially difficult to, to fight back against, to, to target and say no to. Okay? All right. So that's me, my quick tour through why I think perspectives produce these kinds of strong rhetorical features that uh, uh, contribute to determining, explaining, um, producing these strong rhetorical features that Booth, Moran, and Cohen are talking about in the quotes that I read out. I think that talking about, I think I've said a little bit more about what perspectives are and how they work, uh, why it's an only metaphorical to talk about perspectives, but why it's a good metaphor. Um, but basically, I think this is what most people are thinking about intuitively when they say that metaphors are these powerful rhetorical devices, right? Um, but I don't think that's the end of the story. And in particular, uh, I think it's really important and interesting that perspectives are not distinctive to metaphor. Metaphors do this framing kind of thing. But this framing effect, the use of perspectives, is ubiquitous across communication. It's something that happens with communication lots and lots of the time. So in particular, insinuations, what I like to think of as telling details, slurs, they all also traffic in and promulgate perspectives. So, um, my, uh, so here are some of my favorite examples of, most of my favorite example of a telling detail. A telling detail is something that's just a little thing, seems like it's innocuous in its own right, why can you get upset about it, but then it's supposed to be revealing, right? So my favorite example of this is, did you know Barack Obama's middle name is Hussein? I'm just saying. Right? So I'm, I'm leaving you to draw all your conclusions that you might want to draw. I'm just saying, you can't deny that that's his middle name. I'm just letting you draw your own conclusions from that. Right? Another example, um, you know, you say, uh, do you like John's new girlfriend? Oh, she's fine. You know, she's a barista. Right? So I'm not saying anything false on that, but you know, I'm communicating a whole bunch of attitudes that I'm leaving sort of off the table or under the table, right? But I'm not doing it in a way that doesn't make me say anything really mean, right? Uh, so finally, slurs. If I say that somebody's a wetback, let's say, then I'm communicating that, that word, uh, I think conventionally as part of its you know, meaning in the language, communicates a whole complicated set of stereotypes and attitudes and denigrating uh, sort of um, uh, even you know, sort of recommendations for action and interaction with people of the relevant group. Okay? So these kinds of perspectives are something that we play with and traffic in and manipulate throughout conversation a lot of the time. Philosophers, like to, we like to pretend, we like to fantasize, we like to assume that people are very interested in trading pieces of information. That's not all we're doing a lot of the time. Um, 
So, so you can't just point to perspectives and say, ah, oh, that's why metaphors are so powerful, because other kinds of language do this as well. But I do think that the kinds of perspectives that metaphors produce are especially powerful for two reasons. One, they're novel, they're new, they're not just stereotypes like the ones that are associated with slurs. And secondly, they're analogical. They involve this matching of one thing to another. So why, does that, why do those things make a difference? First, a live metaphor, and this is something that uh, Booth, I think, is saying when he says, you know, they're performing an identical dance step. When you hear a live metaphor, a new metaphor, you are yoking two things together that had not been brought together before in your mind. And the result, the way you're led to think about the subject depends upon the interaction between that particular subject and that particular frame. So one way to bring this out is the metaphor of Julia, that when you say Julia is a son, that communicates something di very different from if you say that Achilles is a son, where it's communicating he's a warrior who's like, you know, uh, striding across the battlefield. Or even Louis XIV is a son, where it's he's the center of political power, right? The different subjects produce, and different contexts, produce different kinds of frames, different kinds of uh, uh, perspectives, even given the same, the same frame, meaning top term. So you're yoking the specific subject and the specific frame together. And that requires specific cognitive work. And so that means that you've done something sort of, you've succeeded in bringing some two particular things together in a particular way, in a way that's not true of, say, slurs or uh, general sort of insinuation, uh, stereotype, trafficking in stereotypes, for instance. Specifically, what you've done is you, I haven't just, uh, so there are other situations where I might use something about a particular context we're in, might give you a certain kind of perspective on a certain kind of way of thinking about things, and I might say, oh, and then, you know, she's just like that. Um, the analogical fat feature of metaphorical perspectives, I think, lends them extra power. So you're thinking of one thing by way of this lens of something else, and you have to do this matching process. Um, and this is what, I think this is what Cohen is saying when he says there's an in invitation to intimacy. So not everybody would know what those assumptions were that I was intending you to match, right? You're, you've got some specific knowledge, both about the frame, but also about the subject that allows you to make that match. And so you know what I'm talking about, about the subject that makes that match a suitable thing. And so that brings you into my orbit and my way of thinking about the subject in order to make the framework. So merely comprehending what I'm up to and what the point I'm trying to get across requires you to cultivate and to admit that you're cultivating certain kinds of specific assumptions about what we, you know, what we know and not everybody would know. Uh, and in spe specifically, what I'm asking you to do is establish certain kinds of matches between the two subjects that I got, I'm not spelling out explicitly. And so that means you've got to supply, you've got to do, the cure has got to do the cognitive work of making those matches. And this produces what Arthur Danto calls, and he calls it more generally, an enthymematic gap. So there's an inference, a, a enthym a, there's a gap in it, there's an inference you have to do, which is left unstated. And the hearer makes that move. And the fact that the hearer can succeed in making that move, you know, makes it seem like it, it, it's out there to be made. It's not something that I, some crazy thing that I, the speaker, am telling you. It's something that you, you know what we're talking about. Right? And that leads to a kind of uh, uh, what Danto calls a seductive, it seductively co-opts the hearer into making, into this process of interpretation. There's actually some interesting empirical work suggesting that this is, this is actually uh, psychologically accurate, uh, which I can talk about in the discussion period if we have time. Okay, so, so far I've said metaphors have these interesting features, complicity, irresistibility, and difficulty of denial, and they have that in part because of perspectives, right? And they, uh, lots of things, uh, lots of aspects of communication produce perspectives, but metaphors do it in an especially powerful way. Metaphorical perspectives are especially powerful. But I still don't think that's the end of the story. So there are two more things about what metaphors do that I think are also really important and powerful. So the next thing is that metaphors don't just put perspectives on the table. They don't just communicate perspectives. They presuppose those perspectives in the service of something else. They say, you, you do this business of yoking subject and frame together in order to understand this claim that I'm making, this insult that I'm making. So, as a result, any direct denial, if I say, you know, George is not a tail wagging lap dog of privilege, I'm saying George is not that way. And to figure out the way that I, the hearer, have just said he's not, you gotta go back and use that same perspective. It's that way, the way that the speaker was claiming that George was. 
And so even though I've denied the specific claim that George is taking away having talked about that other privilege, I'm still getting to what that thing is that I'm saying is not true requires going through this perspective and in that sense perpetuates it. Okay? So um, similarly, uh, if I say um, no man is an island uh, entire of itself, the famous John Dunn metaphor, what I do is to figure out what that would mean, I say, what would it be for a man to be on an island? Hmm. He's, no man is that way, right? What it would be for a man to be an island, be self-sufficient, you know, um, uh, uh, emotionally free of everybody else, whatever. No man is that way, right? So that's similarly what's happening. Uh, what way would it be for George to be the tail lagging lap dog of privilege? George isn't that way, but I still cultivate it. I'm still trafficking in this way of thinking. Let me just keep on going because I want to make sure I get through everything and then we can talk. Um, so again, this is a powerful, interesting thing, this idea of presupposing something. Um, uh, but again, it's not something that's distinctive to metaphor. This is something that happens a lot. So any, there are a variety of kinds of ways of communicating something, getting something on, into the communicative, onto the communicative table that are not what's called at issue. They're not the central point. And targeting, dealing with, denying any of those non-central aspects of meaning um, is difficult. So saying, no, that's not true, is always going to target the main at issue content. And you're always going to have to say, hey, wait a minute, are you suggesting that da, 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 if you want to challenge something that's not at issue? And so, so, for instance, if I say, you know, has George stopped beating his wife yet? I can't say yes. I can't say no. Right? I have to say, what do you mean? He doesn't even have a wife. He got to be beating her. Right? Um, uh, again, if I, say George, if I say Jane is poor but honest, um, you know, you might want to think, what, what, what? You're, you're, you're suggesting there's some kind of problem, some kind of tension between being poor and being honest. This is a famous philosopher's example. I just have to say it's not my example. Um, there's some kind of tension between being poor and honest. But I don't... You're, you're saying, like, it's a good thing about Jane that she's poor but honest, but you're, if I agree with you, I'm suggesting that I agree that it's surprising that you could be poor and honest. I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, and even a more straightforward denial can have this kind of effect. So for a lot of people, when Nixon said over and over, I am not a crook, I am not a crook, that just started to, like, raise in people's minds and reinforce what he would be like if he was a crook, and it brought out all the crook, crookedness aspects of him, right? So it reiterated and sort of promulgated the same way of thinking again. So again, this is not something that's uh, distinctive to metaphor. It's true, but it's not something that's distinctive to metaphor. But again, when metaphors do this, it's especially, the way metaphors do this is especially powerful, partly because there's no one particular claim that is being presupposed. It's this whole complicated way of thinking that's being presupposed. And so it's especially difficult to challenge, and especially uh, it's amorphous, it's context dependent, and you got to get it, you know, you have to do this whole yoking the one thing to the other to even figure out what the main claim is. As a result, if I, any kind of response, if I say, yes, George is a tail wagging lap dog of privilege, if I say, no, George is not a tail wagging lap dog of privilege, even if I say, um, actually, George, you know, uh, worked his way up from, uh, you know, janitorial jobs, even that shows that I know what you were after when you were saying he was a tail wagging lap dog of privilege. So that reveals that I succeeded in yoking subject and frame together, and in that sense, that there was, you know, you know what I was talking about, right? So in that sense, you... You reveal your success in comprehending. Okay. Last thing is that uh, metaphors don't just presuppose perspectives. They presuppose them in the service of assertions, or promises, or whatever, but also focus on assertions. Assertions that are not uh, given by what the language itself means. So pragmatics is the study of language use as opposed to semantics, which is the study of what words mean, right? So pragmatics is the study of how we use words to communicate. Semantics is the study of what words themselves mean. And so the metaphorical content is determined by me using the words in a certain kind of way. But I'm using them to make a certain kind of assertion, a certain kind of force, a, a assertion which has a certain kind of force. So as a result, metaphors combine the force of an assertion with the kind of mm, amorphousness and indeterminacy, not, you don't know exactly what the content is that you get from other kinds of pragmatic speech where what I mean is determined by how I'm using the words in this particular context. So let me see how I can communicate this quickly. Um, all right, I'm just going to give you my favorite example. So my way of communicating, my best, my best example to convince you that metaphors have the force of assertion is this example from 2 Samuel. So this is the story of King David and Bathsheba, or King David and Uriah. So uh, 
Once there was a man, there was a beautiful woman, and her name was Bathsheba, and she uh, had a devoted husband, Uriah, and they were poor, but happy and honest. And uh, they, but King David laid eyes on Bathsheba and saw that she was beautiful and decided he wanted to take her into his castle to be one of his many wives. And so uh, he had Uriah, who was a soldier in his army, sent out to the forefront of battle and exposed to enemy attack, where Uriah unsurprisingly died. And so then uh, uh, King David gets this, the no news that Uriah has died, brings Bathsheba to live in the castle in the, in the, in the castle with him, and gets her pregnant and is feeling very pleased with himself. Right? The Lord does not like this. So the Lord sends the prophet Nathan down to remonstrate, to, to reprimand um, uh, David. And what Nathan does is he says, let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there was a rich man and a poor man. And the rich man had many sheep, and the poor man had a large flock, and the poor man had but one little ewe lamb who he nursed and said, you know, gave, say, drank from his cup and ate from his plate. And he raised him up as a, you know, a, a member of the family. And one day, a traveler came to the rich man, and the rich man spared not of his own flock. He didn't kill one of his own huge flock, but took the one little poor lamb to a poor man's lamb and served it to dinner for the traveler. And David hears the story, he says, ah, that horrible rich man. And then Nathan says, thou art the man. And then David says, oh my god, you're right. And he repents, and, uh, you know, whatever, but it's too late, and so he has to pay fourfold for his sins, and all kinds of terrible things happen. So, my contrast here is between the case where Nathan comes down, tells this story, this parable, and says, by the way, whatever happened to Uriah? What? What? I, yeah. What? What? That's what, what's she doing in there? Right. So you could, you could. Nathan could have made salient. He could have like gotten you to try to notice that there was some kind of analogy between these two situations, right? He could have juxtaposed the two situations, to try to get you to bring. That's not all that he does by saying, "Thou art the man." He does something much more forceful. He makes a claim. He lays something on the table. You are. The rich man, right? You have done what that rich man did, and that is, you have done to uh, Uriah this little sheep, this little lamb. But anyway, um, you have done to Uriah what the rich man did for me. Um, so, in the, my claim is that in making a metaphor, there's something with the punch of assertion, "Thou art the man," that goes beyond just getting you, inviting you to compare two situations. And I think we feel that very strongly in this case. Um, okay. So there is this force of assertion. On the other hand, to figure out what it means, thou art the man, you gotta do all this work of yoking the one thing to the other and making these matches, and you know, it's all very complicated and context dependent. And as a result, if Nathan then sort of chickened out, and David said, are you saying that I did this and that? He could say, oh, I didn't really claim that. You know, I was just blaming you. You know, I have to throw a good party. Uh, I'm just blaming that, um, you know, you're very generous to your, uh, to your visitors, right? That wouldn't be a good idea because the Lord would be mad, but you know, it, you could deny the matches that he was intending and just fall back on some other matches, right? So there's this mixture of this punch and not having it be exactly determined and exactly obvious, there being some room for negotiation about exactly what it is that the, is behind that punch. Okay, so that's my tour through, uh, and then so in this respect, metaphor contrasts with other kinds of pragmatic speech, speech where you're communicating something by using the words in a specific kind of context, because it has this force to it. Okay? All right, so that's my tour through why metaphorical insults are so rhetorically powerful. They combine these three independent features of perspectives, uh, presupposition, and uh, pragmatics in a distinctively, uniquely distinctively powerful package. Okay, but now, before I close, there is an objection that I think is fairly natural that I, and important and that I want to spend some, some time mentioning, discussing. So the objection is, look back at those original quotes from the first page. Both Booth and Moran make a big deal about the lack of will, about the way in which uh, it's, um, uh, metaphor, they emphasize the metaphor and so produce effects that are unwanted and unwilled. They say, you know, uh, Booth says, you simply, the hearer simply cannot resist, right? And uh, Moran talks about an image being, uh, being produced beneath the level of volition and deliberation, right? 
But you might think for that very reason, if this is something that just happens to you, if this is something that the speaker like hits you over the head, does something to you, how is that something that you could feel guilty for? How is that something that you could be complicit in, that you could be responsible for? Complicity requires some kind of active involvement, right? And in particular, legal complicity, uh, you know, for, um, uh, um, uh, you know, for to make a charge of um, uh, complicity stick, you need to have uh, overt knowing participation in some kind of enterprise, yet where you at least had some good awareness. Of what I have it here um, in an enterprise whose ultimate outcome one endorses or at least could plausibly foresee. You gotta sort of know what you're in for in order to be a conspirator in a you know to be charged with conspiracy. So why? How can you be both? irresistibly drawn to do something and responsible for it. Seems like there's a tension here in the very phenomenon that I'm talking about. So I agree that the effect can be unwilled, but I deny that heroes are just passive victims in a way that makes a talk of complicity inappropriate. I think there's a, I think that's part of what I wanted to spend the time with the picture. There's a really interesting mixture here of cognitive activity and passivity. You're doing something, but something is happening to you, but it's a, it's a very interesting mixture. Um, so, but it's, what's important to me is I want to deny that we're just passive victims. So first, as cognitive agents, we, you know, just as, as, as people who are thinkers in the world, we can direct our attention in some ways and away from other things. We can use certain kinds of concepts and not others. We can, you know, we can uh, manipulate and to some degree control our patterns of thought about what we're thinking about. Um, uh, further, as conversational interlocutors, as people in a conversation, we willingly enter into a cooperative enterprise of communication. Staying in the conversation is a kind of agreement to participate in an, in, a, 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 you know, a, a, at least minimally cooperative exchange. Uh, so insofar as you're part of the conversation, you are an agent and not, and not just a victim. Further, metaphorical interpretation, as I've been emphasizing, goes beyond the sort of minimal level of agency. It draws on these sophisticated, nuanced aspects of our thinking and, you know, molds us sort of molding our minds in sophisticated, complex, rich ways. In ways that it requires a kind of imaginative engagement with the, what the speaker is up to that's closer to sort of empathetic imagination. Right? And in that sense, even when we don't want to do it, even when it happens super fast, even when it's in some sense automatic, it's still a rich and something that is calling on us as a person and not just as like, you know, a recipient. Um, okay. The problem is that we can't know exactly what the perspective is going to be until we've actually tried it on, until we've actually let our minds be molded in the relevant pattern. And at that point, it's too late. We've already done this thing that we now feel guilty for. So we've done a thing, we've gone along with something, there is this kind of agency, uh, but figuring out what it is that we're going along with comes too late. The second point that I want to make, so the first point is just that comprehension itself involves a kind of cognitive activity, a kind of cognitive agency, even if it's not you know, voluntary, conscious reflection and planning of what I'm going to do. Lots of our lives aren't like that. Lots of what we do and hold each other responsible for doing involves immediate, you know, unthinking action, but it's still things we do, right? When I punch somebody, typically when I punch somebody, uh, it's uh, not something that I thought about and premeditated and planned. I just haul off and punch the guy, and then I'm stuck with it. It's still something I'm responsible for, right? So if we're gonna, the kinds of standards we want to hold uh, people to for agency in general, I think are in place here. The second point is that we're not just, we're not just passive victims as hearers of, uh, meta of metaphorical insults, because we're not just hearers. We then, it's a conversation, we then have some kind of opportunity to respond. How we respond is at least as important as comprehension. And here, this is the sort of practical part of the, paper, of the talk, here's what you should do, I think, when confronted with a metaphorical insult. So there are two kinds of things you could do. And I think these are at least, I, you know, I've said that a direct denial, even a, a certain kind of indirect denial, can be difficult because it leaves the perspective standing, it leaves the perspective as governing the terms of the conversation. But there's something that, that you're not, that's not all you can do. So here are two things you can do. The first thing is the thing that philosophers are especially good at doing, which is what I think of as flat-footed pedantic incomprehension. So you say, exactly what could you mean by saying that George is a tail? I, I'm sorry, I just don't understand what you could even mean by that, right? And just refuse to go along with the game. 
refuse just flat-footedly, and that's a kind of refusal to be cooperative as a hearer. The speaker wants to be like, come on, you know what, you know what I mean. And you're saying, no, I don't know what you're doing, I'm, gonna play, I'm not going to play your game. So that's the first kind of move. The problem with that is that it might be palpably obvious to everybody exactly what you mean, like what, exactly what the speaker should have done. And you're, you might look kind of stupid for, say, insisting that you don't know what, the, outside of philosophy circles, of course, uh, uh, insisting that you don't know what the speaker could mean. So often, and, and then the other thing that's problematic about this sometimes is, you know, you, everybody kind of knows that what the speaker meant, and maybe that it sort of seems appropriate, and you're left with it lingering in your own mind as the way the speak, you know, as framing the subject in question. And that makes you feel still guilty and sort of cognitively dirty. So a good response, especially if you can do it in real time, is to come up with another metaphor that reframes the subject in your own terms, right? So that dislodges the original metaphor, the original frame, and remolds the conversation and everybody else's minds in your preferred pattern, right? So one, um, uh, one way to do that is to appear to agree with the speaker, but twist the metaphor to a different kind of frame. Okay, so here I've got, imagine Benvolio, so, so Romeo is in love with Juliet, Romeo is a Montague, no, is a Capulet, which one's, she's a Capulet, right? She's a Capulet. She's a Capulet, good, good, you guys are much more, uh, okay. So uh, Juliet is a Capulet, Romeo is a Montague, they're, you know, uh, and mortal enemies, Benvolio is Romeo's friend, who just doesn't want him to be involved in this, you know, stupid romance. And so you can imagine Rome, Benvolio saying to his friend Romeo, trying to get him, get him out of this stupid infatuation, saying, yeah, Juliet sure is the son. She'll burn you and blind you if you get too close, right? So twisting the kind of matches that you might have uh, and setting up a different interpretation. The other thing is you might say, you might deny it, but then sort of uh, substitute an analogous, a, a different frame in its place. So Juliet's not the sun, she's a bumpy little asteroid, wandering off in her own weird corner of cold, dark space, right? Like, so replace, sticking with the sort of celestial metaphor, but finding a different kind of match that is supposed to be that productive and produce your own kind of image. Either way, with this reframing kind of uh, move, if you appear to agree or if you substitute a new frame, the hearer is now deploying the rhetorical advantages of metaphor for herself, right? She's using all this framing effect, and it's not quite clear exactly what she's claiming, and so you've got to do some work to figure it out. But she's also then going to be vulnerable to the same kinds of criticisms and the same kind of uh, sort of possibilities of incomprehension and stuff that the original metaphor was vulnerable to. Okay? So you're fighting fire with fire. That's often the best way to go, but you've got to be careful. All right, so thank you. That's it.